And this model was made clear by the head of permanent TSB as he justified the bank's first increase before an Oireachtas committee in the autumn. Clearly a business model where you pay more for your raw material, what we call deposits, than you do for your finished products, what we call mortgages, is not a sustainable business model. But if you have a tracker mortgage based on the European Central Bank rate, it's unemployment levels and inflation rates across Europe that will decide what you have to pay. But that can lead to entirely inappropriate rates for Ireland. Professor John Taylor of Stanford University has developed an internationally accepted rule based on unemployment and inflation that shows what interest rates should be and how inappropriately low interest rates drove our housing boom from 2001 to 2006. The further along the horizontal line a country appears, the less appropriate interest rates were for its situation, while the vertical line shows the scale of its housing boom. A group of countries deviated only very slightly from the rule and showed very small growth in housing investment. But in France, for instance, interest rates were a little less suitable and there was some growth in housing investments. Interest rates in Spain were far from what the Taylor Rule says they should have been and it showed soaring housing investment. But at the very outer edge of the graph was Ireland, with entirely inappropriately low interest rates and rocketing housing investment. So inappropriately low interest rates fueled our housing boom and the worry for the future is that as Europe recovers, unsuitably high interest rates will damage any recovery here. Everybody would agree uh, that wh whatever about recovery in Europe and Ireland, the recovery in Ireland will, will happen sometime after that of the Eurozone. So you are almost certainly going to be in a situation that the, the Eurozone is emerging from recession, interest rates will start moving up, Ireland will be lagging behind, and so at precisely uh, the, the time where you would want low interest rates, the rates will be moving against us. But I think you need to put that in context, though, and remember that rates will only be increasing because economic recovery is happening at the, you know, in, in the Eurozone and hopefully elsewhere. So while the pain of increasing mortgage rates for householders is likely to be very real over the coming couple of years, that pain may be alleviated as demands for our goods grows, leading to a little more certainty about the most important aspect of maintaining your income, keeping your job. Donna Diamond, Charlie Weston, paint a picture for us. First of all, what is likely to happen in the short term in relation to interest rates? Well, Miriam, it's likely that uh, mo most, if not all, the other lenders will follow permanent TSB and increase their interest rates. The interest rates that they can increase, which are these standard variable interest rates, um, they can't really increase uh, anything else. They can't increase uh, tracker rates because they're tied in. You're, you have an agreement that they're tied into the European Central Bank rate. And if you have a fixed rate, well, you're locked into a fixed rate over a period. So what's likely to happen is uh, standard variable rates will, will, will go up. Now, something like 350,000 people have standard variable rates. So there's a lot of people out there who are vulnerable. And the worry is that this could be a tipping point, that a lot of people who are surviving at the moment may, may not survive so well if interest rates go up, if the banks push up their standard variable rates. And will there be an impact as well, Charlie, later in the year as expected if the ECB rates go up again? Yeah, the expectation is that, you know, that possibly at the, at the end of the year the European Central Bank will push up rates. That would mean standard variable rates would go up again. It would also mean the tracker rates would, would, would go up. So it's a difficult one. If you have, say, a half percent increase in a €250,000 mortgage, you're talking about extra monthly payments of about €65, €66, Euros, um, which, which, you know, quite considerable. So if we get... Um, standard variable rates going up by half, maybe 1% this year, and then if the European Central Bank starts increasing rates at the end of the year, it could be quite a difficult year on the mortgage front for people. Could interest rates affect people a good bit, Noli? I mean, obviously people say it's the loss of a job that tips yeah. you over, I suppose, but I suppose if you're on the border, if you're having another child or something, interest rates going up could tip you that's over? That's right. Whatever it is that increases the pressure on the household budget, that's, that's your problem. Um, and also, even if you don't see it coming immediately, the very fact that it may be coming in the future is a source of stress. So we see in flat not just problems directly related to debt, but family problems, um, all sorts of other problems arise. Small businesses uh, get into more trouble with extra rates and okay. uh, rates increases, etc. So there's, there are all sorts of extra difficulties. Okay, Pat Farrell, I think a lot of people feel like we've been incredibly good to the banks, the taxpayer, right? In fact, we own you. And yet you've come along and you've repaid the people's kindness with the fact that you're going to put up their interest rates. Well, unfortunately, Mary, you've, in, you've engaged in a, in a flawed argument or a false argument, which I've heard said on a number of occasions. The reality is because the banks have been 
had the bailout from the from the government, for which we're extremely grateful. It's the only other the only source of capital and indeed the guarantee. So that's why costing, cut up the rights? If you let me if you explain it, the, that's costing uh, the banks 1.5 billion this year. As a direct consequence of that, and because of the fact that money is more expensive to raise, generally speaking, uh, the banks have to reprice their mortgages. Any there's, there are kids out there at the moment that are doing their mock exams. They will know that if you pay 3% for money and you lend it out at 2, that is not sustainable. Therefore, banks will have to inevitably increase the rates. And they have to do that, actually, in order to decrease the risk that is there for the taxpayer at the moment, because the taxpayer is providing a guarantee and is providing capital to the banks. Yeah, but I suppose so you're talking about the standard is, rules, Pat, let me come in for a moment, of capitalism. But they were broken. They were breached. In other words, banks were going to collapse. We bailed you out, and in response, you, your act of kindness back to the taxpayer is to up their mortgages in times of dire need. No, that, is that, that fair? That, that is a populist argument, but it has not rooted in reality. The fact of the matter is that the intervention that has been made has to be paid for. It has to be remunerated. Otherwise, what happens, banks go out of business, and the economy, which is the point I think made in your package earlier on, ceases to exist. Okay, Kieran we have in unemployment at a rate way beyond okay, the current Huff, situation. In even greater do you ever get annoyed with the banks that you did give them this bailout, you did allow them to survive, and then in yeah, return I, they're just look, going I, to increase I, I, I have no rates. great sympathy for the banks. Uh, I think a, a combination of government policy in previous governments and banking policy led to people like some of those you featured taking out enormous mortgages that they simply could not pay. And the Greens were holding up a flag saying, this okay. is wrong, we've got to control this. So at this stage, I think we've got to expect something in return from the banks. They are paying for the money that they've been okay, given. Well, tell them more, because I have to... You can talk to them in a moment and tell them what you want, but Kieran Cuff, Pat Farrell, I did want to bring you back in Charlie Weston, but I have run out of time. I'm sorry about that for tonight. And also, Nolan Buckle, thank you. Keelan. Thanks. Well, tonight, 8,500 intellectually disabled adults and children are living in accommodation that is entirely unregulated. The state pays about £1.5 a year for this, yet it carries out no independent inspections. And according to today's Irish Times, hundreds of complaints of abuse and mistreatment have been made in recent years. But as well as those in unregulated facilities, there are currently a further 320 intellectually disabled people who are being inappropriately cared for in psychiatric hospitals. Six years ago, Primetime Investigates met one such woman. When we first met Deirdre Stafford, she was on a home visit. She had spent more than 20 years of her life being cared for in a locked psychiatric institution. Suffering from mild autism, for both Deirdre and her family, her treatment had been devastating. <laughs> She wasn't there terribly long when I went to see her one evening and she would only talk to me in a whisper. And uh, she was obviously very, very frightened. To put an autistic person into a psychiatric facility and to expect them to conform is insanity. Deirdre's behaviour can be unpredictable and she has been violent towards herself and others. She's had to be restrained in hospital and described being put in straitjackets. Do you remember being in a straitjacket? I do. Can you tell me about that? What was that? I didn't like being in two because my arms would pay me. Your arms would pain you? Yeah. Like what? At the back. My hands beside the back. And why would they put you into the straitjacket? Because it's bold of the indulgent bodies. You were bold, is that Yes. Right? Her father became so concerned about her treatment in hospital that he took her home, but struggled to deal with her alone. Oh. Deirdre was very disturbed at home. Uh, she would rip everything asunder with rage and frustration. The same frustration has led her to pull out with her own fingers about seven of her own teeth. Eventually, Eamon had to admit that he couldn't care for Deirdre alone but his only available option was another psychiatric hospital. As a father and as a parent, I feel a failure. Here am I delivering my daughter, you know, she's very precious to me. And here am I delivering her into this system, you know, which is a hell hole, it's a hell. For an autistic person to be in the psychiatric system is a living hell. Eamon has recently had Deirdre assessed by two independent psychologists. One report said that over her life she'd been placed in seclusion rooms, put in straitjackets and medicated inappropriately. 
Both reports raised questions about Deirdre's medication. One report recommended an immediate independent review of what it said appears to be an excessive medical regime. The second also called for an urgent review of her medication to be carried out.